Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. I'm excited to be back with you today. Another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, more bite-sized business advice. And we have a very special guest. I'm excited to dive in here, Sean Atkinson, and he is a brand and marketing specialist. I know before you before you pause the episode and move on, I get it. I get it. We discussed this before we started recording. There's a bajillion marketing gurus out there. Sean isn't one of them. He's better than that because he has actual advertising and hands-on experience marketing and growing brands in the real world. He did not get this stuff from a book. So I'm excited before we go any further, Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to have the conversation. I always get nervous as I kind of hinted at there when someone says mm. they're a marketing specialist because I, I've personally seen no less than a dozen of them on the internet today, like this morning. Yeah. And, yeah. and they're always pitching some different product or tactic or trend. It's mm. challenges, Facebook ads, billboards, and I'm I'm just tired of it. So can you give me some context? We We all have seen that marketplace. How would you describe yourself in in relation to that market? Uh, I I look at things more on an individual basis, but one of the things that I can tell you is uh, I've spent the past thirty plus years gathering information and and just pulling it all together. Uh, I would say one of the things that I looked for was the overlap in between different industries. Uh, because if you can understand the one common thread, then it allows you to be able to start to figure out how you're going to weave everything else together from there. So if you have that as a starting point and a foundation, uh, you can take those best practices, but you have to take the next step and figure out how to be able to give someone actionable steps that they can implement into their business and their situation. So a lot of the information that's out there is a one size fits all, but it's missing the next steps that come after it. Uh, my focus is on not just giving you that initial information. I'm going to tell you why it's important, and then we'll discuss the next steps that come after it that strictly align with your business, not just making it for everybody. I love this. I, I could nerd out on this all day long. My business partner actually has very similar experience, 25 years in consulting with the Fortune 100. Um, sounds like you guys have very similar backgrounds. We're in it forever notice the core principles and then figure out how to distill that for small businesses. And I want to hear, you know, we're more of the operational side from the mm -hmm. COO perspective, your marketing, which I fully don't understand just to be transparent, but what did, like, what were some of those things that you noticed were the, the core principles of marketing that are always there in every industry? It starts with the audience. They'll tell you everything that you need to know. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a huge budget to be able to find it out. Uh, a lot of it is conversational and it requires you to pay attention. Uh, for, for As context, one of the first jobs I had in marketing was uh, I was the annoying guy that would be in a mall and asking if you had time for a survey. And uh, I, I, I lived in New York and then I moved out to California and California is a place where you actually need a car. And I got that job because I needed a car. And it was something where if you didn't have a decent close rate, you weren't going to keep your job. So uh, the power of observation and reading the room is what allowed me not only to be able to uh, to survive there, but thrive. Uh, I, I realized that, you know, time is is everything. So it's I don't necessarily need to catch someone when they first come in. I want to observe their, you know, their how they're moving around through that environment. And in this case, let's take it a step further and say, okay, let's take it out of the mall and look at the industry or a market on a whole. How are you navigating through it? Uh, if you come in and I see you're in a hurry and you're one of those people that's in and out, then you know what you're looking for. And you're not looking for someone to educate you on it. You're looking for someone to say, I've got the solution. Here's the solution that I have. Let's see if you're a good fit for it as opposed to uh, if it's someone that comes in and they're just kind of hanging out and they always leave with a bag, but they don't know what they're going in to get, then that's a different conversation. So the better you understand the audience and the more you pay attention to what they're doing, you can not only find the solution that they're looking for, but how much they prioritize it. 
Now, that's the thing that I think is really important. Uh, a lot of these things that you'll see online is they'll say, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is what they want. You need to know how much they prioritize it, because if they're not prioritizing it, your sales process is a lot longer. If you're a smaller business or if you have something where you need to have a shorter sales process, you need to go after the people that are actually prioritizing it. If you've got enough banked where you have a large funnel and you have a lot of prospects, then what you're looking at is you're looking at it saying, OK, I know how long the sales process may be. I just need to have enough people flowing through it enough so that I'm not scrambling or chasing money that makes me look past red flags that would not only hurt them, but it would hurt me. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And conceptually, that obviously makes sense. You have to read the market and serve what people want. But can you give me an example of um, a client you've worked with maybe? Um, and you can change names, you can change company names. That's totally fine. We don't want to violate NDAs here. But um, the, the high level view of like maybe when you went into a company and they were a little bit off and how you helped them streamline this process. Because the other thing that I have an issue with in in the marketing industry as a whole is this idea of of filling your funnel and i i understand the concept of it but to me what you just said was really really insightful about overlooking red flags because your mm. funnel is stuffed and you're kind of just fitting people into products i i think in an ideal world we could imagine our funnels as a pipe like why why can't we find the perfect client Put them in mm -hmm. our process and have them all exit the same way so we're not squeezing we're just mm -hmm. channeling so can you help me through this uh well let me address that part first um it's extremely important if you if you to be efficient with your sales funnel or your pipeline uh if if you've just got the top part of it so wide open that you you're not necessarily being efficient with it because you have to segment that audience down to people that actually matter and then what are you doing with all the people that didn't? Right. So that effort, if you put more of the effort on the front end to making sure that you have people that fit what you're looking for, that whole process runs smoother. Your sales process is shorter. So for an example, uh, I, I've worked with people that had uh, issues with their customer journey mapping. And that's just another way of saying, where is your ideal audience entering into that customer journey? We just talked about a, a bit of it using the mall analogy of some people are going to go into the mall and they already know what they want. If 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 your business is instruction in a way to be able to answer the questions of something uh, of someone that already knows what they want, then you're going to be one of those people that gets on their nerves and they're just going to want to get away from you as quickly as possible. So it's knowing who you want as an audience and then structuring your sales process to uh, to make that smooth transition for them, uh, as opposed to saying, I'm just going to get as many people as I can and then I'll just narrow that down. I would only tell someone to do something like that is if they had partnerships and collaborations as a way to be able to not only uh, help their business, but uh, be able to feed into other businesses and, and they're building their business around mostly referrals. So if you're doing paid advertising, if you're doing marketing where you're putting budget towards it, you want to be as specific as possible when it comes to your audience. If you're doing something where you're, uh, you've got more collaborations, then it's great to know different uh, people that are different parts of that process. Uh, because when you get someone that's not the best lead, you can always give a referral to someone else. And then you've, you're building up that relationship. And as long as it's someone that uh, runs parallel or runs uh, in a different part of the process that you're working, uh, then you're in a great position. So, for example, uh, clothing industry. Uh, I've had clients that they have they have they they want to be the the brand. They want to be you know I'm I'm fun. I'm entertaining. I'm I'm you know I want everybody says they they're there for uh, luxury. Anytime you look at online and they want to charge a little bit more for something, they put the word luxury in it. Luxury is what you're really paying for is you're paying for ease of use. If you go into a luxury store, they're, they're handing you water. They're, they're making the whole process easier for you to spend more money. But if you go into something and they're making it difficult for you and they've got long lines, are you really getting the luxury experience? You're supposed to, luxury is speaking to catering to that person's needs. If you're not catering to someone's needs, if you've got a line out the door or when they're willing to give you the money that you have to wait and go through extra steps to be able to get it. So that goes back to knowing who your audience is and where you're trying to connect with them in the customer journey. 
uh, this is where it goes away from, uh, oh, it's just awareness, uh, the decision-making process, and then actually getting the completion uh, in the sales process. Because they'll say the no like, trust. There's more nuance to it. You want to actually know who your audience is and how much they're prioritizing the issue. If it's a challenge that they have and you know how much of a challenge it is, how much they're prioritizing it and what questions they're going to have, you eliminate all the all the extra things in that process. You can get them from going to your website to going straight to the car, as opposed to if you get someone and you don't know who your audience is, you have to spend all that time trying to figure that out. So it's, it's almost like a choose your own adventure thing. Uh, you want to be able to find the people that are, are, are going to have a shorter sales process, but you also have to plan for the ones that might have a longer process. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, in a perfect world, people just knock on your door and come in hypothetically, right? Like they, they, they come to your website, they hit buy now, whatever the price is, you, you've done your job in marketing, yeah. if that's the case. But that's yes. obviously not the case because most people don't get it that right, especially not when they're launching a new product, a new service line, a new business, mm -hmm. whatever phase of business you're in. So I would love to also break down, you know, we, we discussed before we started recording, there are different phases of business. Uh, yes. Our clients yes. typically are the seven, eight figure revenue mark. They got uh, 10 to 50 employees. I mean, they've been in business for a long time. They know what they're doing. Then there's that newer end of the market where maybe your startup, maybe you're four weeks in business. You've launched without knowing exactly what your product is, who your client is. And there's that middle tier, the hundred K to half a million, maybe up to a million revenue. What, what are you doing or what are you, what sort of strategies are you using with these different types of businesses? And we're being very overly generalistic here. So please excuse us for that. But how can we identify our target client in these different revenue ranges, different company profiles, if you will, without breaking the bank and running $6 million of Facebook ads? Absolutely. Uh, there are customer success stories. There's feedback loop forms where you what you the easiest way to look at it is a lot easier to be able to get people to buy from you again than it is to go out and get new customers. Mm -hmm. And the best way to be able to get the ideal customer that you want is to have your ideal customer tell you more about who they are and how they found you and walk you through the process of what they were thinking of. So if you take it to the jobs to be done theory. Uh, so we can we can go to something theoretical and then apply it practically. Uh, jobs to be done is really just talking about, uh, depending on who you talk to, it's what do you actually need to be done? And then it's also looking at what led up to you coming to that conclusion of, I, I don't care about any of the rest of this, I only care about this thing. So the more you understand what led up to it, the more you can cover those things so that when they're ready to be able to move forward, they have what they need. So if we look at it from different stages, uh, a newer business, and this is something that I have in what I call the, the five tiers of brand clarity, uh, you're starting with if with really just covering who you are. So your brand journey, your why, you start researching your target audience. But when you get to the point where you start to differentiate yourself, there are newer businesses and what they're saying and, and what they can pitch themselves as is, we're, um, we're gonna walk alongside you on this journey if they're a newer business. If they're an existing business, then what they can do is they can talk about their present. Like, these are the things that we, we, where we are. We are we, this is where we place in the industry. If you're a more established business, then you can talk about how long you've been doing it and how long you've been delivering results that people are proud of. Those are three different strategies. You're looking at past, present, and future. Uh, someone that's more established can, can, re can rely more on the past. Uh, someone that is more new needs to focus more on, uh, I understand that there's things that need to change in this industry. I understand that there are people that have been doing it the same way this whole time, and you're tired of doing it that way. And so are we. That's why we came in to be able to walk alongside you and allow you to be able to tell us what you need, and we can do it more in real time. We're an agile business. We're building it based on what you give us as feedback. Uh, that goes back to that marketing research. Um, when you can tell someone that their voice matters, then they're more likely to be able to share it with you. And then it allows you to be able to segment your audience down to the point where uh, you can start finding out, okay, out of a hundred different people, we found 20 that really fit what we wanted. You take that feedback loop and then you go back to that 20 people and you say, you know what, we would really love to be able to find out more. And that's where you start to build that, that, that customer success story. So 
those are things you can literally do for free or you can do with a smaller budget and still get yourself to the point where you get the answers that you need and then that's when you start to put the strategy around i have the information now how do i use it so if you think of branding and marketing and just the whole process essentially what you're doing is you start off learning about the audience and marketing is more about taking what you've learned and repeating it back to them and saying that i get it right mm. the better you get it the shorter the sales process is and the more they'll give you that confirmation based on how quickly they start to go through your sales pipeline and the response that you get afterwards that's that was powerful go back and rewind this 30 seconds and go listen to that again um that was that was an awesome response what i'm curious though too is that's that's great for an existing client base or or even if you know exactly who you want to serve what what i see a lot of times and i'm sure you see it too is whether it's a new business or even a, an established business they kind of just took what came their way and their mm -hmm. business grew into something maybe they didn't design it that way from the start and they're serving a client base that they don't really love and it's not the intention they have when starting their business so when you're in that situation or even when you're brand new and in the same situation, you don't really know who your ideal client is. What are some ways that both both scenarios can go and find out where their ideal client is? Because I think they both know who they are, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily know where to find them. That's why they find themselves just taking whatever clients come their way. What are what are some good ways that we can go out? and do that and be proactive in finding those people and then attracting them to come as our clients. Cultural listening is going to be one of the most affordable ways to be able to do it. And it's really uh, looking at, okay, where do I think they are? And you start to, to use the process of elimination. Uh, you look at the conversations that are, are, are taking place. There's, there tends to be at least a few people within, if, even if, if, whether it's Reddit or whether it's just a regular feed where they're having a real, com a, a real conversation, you start to look through who, who's like-minded in, in their approach, who understands things that you don't necessarily have to explain. When you start to see that there are certain people that click and understand the things that you don't need to explain, that's a box to check. Because anything that you don't have to explain to an audience is something that helps usher them through that sales process faster. So then you start to look at, okay, I need to start following more of these people because these people also know other people that are like that. And that's where social listening starts to kick in. But you can look at review sites. Review sites are going to tell you not only uh, where, uh, how people feel about a product or a service, um, they're uh, more than likely, if they're leaving negative response, they're going to give you extra details because they want to say, I did everything that I was supposed to do and you didn't hold up your end. And if you read those and you read those with that in mind, then you're not just looking at the complaint. You're looking at them saying, here's where I found you. Here's all the research that I did. And here's how I still ended up with this crap result. So bypass the crap result and look at here's how I found you and here's the research that I did. Now you can start looking at putting yourself in those places where they're doing that research. And what you're doing is you're changing uh, your messaging to be able to say, here's how you know you won't get these crappy results. So when someone goes to start looking it up and going, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing, they'll be able to see the people that said they have crappy results and they'll see that your response is saying, yeah, we don't do that. And here's how you know we don't do that. So when they go back and they're doing their due diligence, then they're able to say, okay, you've addressed that problem. And it was, uh, figure it, look almost at it as a frequently asked question, but they didn't ask it. You just said, you know what, if you're here, you might be looking at this and you might be uh, asking this question. And maybe you even got, haven't even gotten to the point of asking that question yet, but you should, and here's the answer. That's that no light trust. You're establishing the trust before they even get to the point of saying, okay, well, what do I need? You're giving them the no light trust all in one sitting, basically by saying, I did my research to find out where you're struggling and some of the things that you're going to win, you're going to want to know. And then I went back earlier into the process to be able to say, okay, not only do I know these things, but here's how I'm addressing them. You just save them time. And when you're saving them time, then that's one more reason for them to want to invest in you. Hmm. That's, that's brilliant. I love that. And now from the customer perspective too, because this, that's awesome for putting yourself out there, getting in front of the right audience, finding where your ideal clients are hanging out. But when you're the customer 
I've, I've fallen for the, the scams out there and the one size fits all. I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have as the audience too listening. So we're all guilty of this, but um, Sean, before I ask you the question, first of all, I put Sean's website on the screen. If you want to go there, connect with him, I encourage you to do that. Um, and it's also in the show notes if you're listening to this episode, but Sean, before we wrap up this last question, um, what, so what do you do from, from the consumer perspective? I want to hire a, a marketing and brand strategist, strategist like yourself or mm. a CFO or an accountant. Like what are some of the things that we should be looking for in terms of red flags, maybe to say, I either need to have more conversations or this is just not for me because good marketing should invoke some sort of an emotional urgency. And I think that's what gets a lot of people. Cause we're like, Nope, this is it. It feels good. It's right. I, I feel compelled to, to hit pay now. Mm -hmm. How do we pause and really evaluate unbiasedly before we make that wrong decision? Uh, that is a great question and one that I will do my best to be able to answer because I run into it a lot. Um, if it's just a random call of someone that may have seen uh, me on Google or something and said, oh, well, I want marketing. Um, I, I literally had someone call me once. And he said, I want to be an Instagram influencer, but he had no idea what the process was. And the first thing that I told him was, um, I don't know that I'm going to be a good fit, but I need to arm you with enough information so that you know what to ask and you know what you need to know. So when you call the next person, you don't tell them what you just told me because the next person is just going to take your money. Yeah. And it's something where what I what I explained to him is there are there are people that are going to bypass certain questions. And what you need to be able to do is is check their check the follow up questions that you need to ask. This is where we just covered. Um, look at the results that other people are getting and start to figure out where they went wrong and then start to backtrack to say, okay, what questions could I be asking to make sure that I don't run into that? And you start to ask those questions, not based on your experience, but based on experience that you know you don't wanna have, then it allows you to start scripting the experience that you actually do wanna have. So uh, when we're running into something where if, if I'm going into an industry that I don't know a lot about, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, I had a, a flood in my, in my place and I needed to replace uh, like my refrigerator. When I had last bought a refrigerator, they were lasting forever. When I started researching the refrigerators, I started finding out that the engine clunks out right around the time when the warranty runs out. Isn't that weird? Interesting. That's uh, the funniest thing, you know? <laughs> so uh, I started looking at, okay, well, uh, what are some of the things that I would need to look out for? I started looking in the reviews and then I started hearing about different bad experiences. And it allowed me to narrow down the company and the type of warranty that I wanted because I saw some people say, well, yeah, we'll replace it, but we need to make sure that we exhausted all options first. No, just no. Um, when when I run into the problem and I pay for a warranty, I, I, I want you to come get this and give me something new because I thought I was getting something that worked. I don't want to be putting my things in small freezers and hoping that you come out and do maintenance and do all the rest of that. So that changed. It, it ruled out a whole bunch of companies and a whole bunch of different warranties all at the same time. And then when it came down to narrowing down my decision, based on the experiences that I saw other people have, it allowed me to know what questions to ask. So uh, the way that I ex explain it is everyone serves as an example in life. Some of the best example and some of the worst case examples of, yes, I want to have that experience or no, I don't want to have that experience. Leverage both. Find out what somebody really loved about an experience from a business standpoint and find out what people didn't love about experience. And that's the same thing both on uh, the consumer side and the business side, because that's the thing that everybody's trying to be able to line up. Uh, I would say one of the things so that you're not just make, making a decision based on uh, an emotional decision, sometimes it's good to know the statistics. 95% of uh, uh, purchase decisions are made based on emotional purchases or emotional connections. Um, if I feel really good about it, I still want to ask those follow-up questions. And I want to know that there's an answer for it. That's where looking at frequently asked questions come into play. If you if you're looking at the questions and they're not just answering A, B, and C, they're up to the point of you know uh, QRS. They're, they've thought through much further down the process. Here's what happens after you pay us. Let me give you an even easier example. I want to talk to people that talk to me about what happens after I give you my money. Because if you don't have anything after that, then you might be one of those companies that was only interested in getting up to that point. And then after that, I'm on my own. So as a consumer, that's how I look at it. 
if I don't see anything with you talking about what happens after the purchase, then I have to ask the question. And if you don't have a clear enough answer, then I, I'm starting to wonder, OK, maybe you're not thinking about what happens after that. And if you're not thinking about what happens after it, then I'm going to be teaching you after I've already given you my money. Not the best experience. For me. I hear that. Those are those are really good tips. Some of them I've never considered. So that's awesome. I'll tell you what, if you're listening, you got this far. Uh, let's let's test Sean. Let's see if he's a man of his word. Go to his website. I dare you. See if he practices what he preaches. Go check him out. Um, he's got a lot of resources there on that page. Again, we'll we'll link to his main website in the description. The one on the screen um, is his his link tree page, and we'll put that in the description as well. You can learn way more about him. We could not talk about all of his knowledge in this quick twenty five minute episode. So, thank you, Sean, for being here. This was a, a fantastic episode. I'm so glad you came on the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Uh, hopefully at some point we can come back and uh, talk about a different subject and uh, see if we can help even more. Done. Consider it done. Sean will be back on Harmonious sure. at Lunch very soon. Wherever you are, watching, listening, whatever, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss this bite-sized business advice at lunch. We want to disrupt the way you think about your business so you can get out of the rat race and actually grow your business. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch.